Chapter 9 I wonder what my grandmother is making, quite loudly, I might add, so early this morning. I can hear music floating down the hallway but can't quite make out the tune. As I walk past the hallway photo gallery, I step into the kitchen and hear a loud thud. It sounds as if someone is falling, repeatedly. I rush to see what the commotion is, and what a commotion it is. There, with a flour sack dishcloth tied around his waist, is my grandfather, standing over the stove, flipping pancakes into the air. The sound, which I thought was someone falling, is him doing some type of hopping dance step in between the pancake clip and the catch. Move over, Barishkanov. Grandpa's in the house. Ah, good morning. How many pancakes do you want? Wow, they smell amazing. Where's Grandma? I ask, looking around his shoulder to see what he put in the batter. Kikwe, what? You don't think your musham can cook? Well, I guess I'm just not used to seeing a man cook. Where did you learn to do this? I can hear Musham's machief accent come through as he replaces a t for the th in think. Or am I the one with the accent because I use th? Doesn't everyone have an accent depending on who's listening? Courtesy of the U.S. Army. I was on KP duty a few months during World War II when I was stationed in Poland. I learned that after a day's worth of fighting, all any soldier wants is a hot meal that reminds him of home. It may have only taken them a few minutes to wolf down a meal, but for those precious moments, soldiers were home sitting at their mama's table. Food does that to you, Grandpa explains as he points his spatula toward the mountainous stack of pancakes. Sounds good to me. Load me up. Now that's what I like to see, a girl with an appetite. Now take some bacon and toast, too. Eat up, my girl. You gotta eat. I gratefully fill my plate, but then turn again to the chef de jour. Grandpa, what were you doing while you were cooking? The little hop thing. Well, it's called a jig. Red River jig, to be exact. I have my little radio here by the stove, and when it gets to playing old-time music, my feet have a mind of their own. We machifs like to dance, he adds with a wink. Grandpa, I thought machif was the language up here, not the people. That mixture between French, Cree, a bit of Scottish, and Ojibwe? Yeah, yes, but for some reason we Turtle Mountain people started calling ourselves machif too. Hmm, someone related to me up at the crack of dawn and dancing what looks like a Scottish jig while making breakfast? Might sound odd, but to me, I totally get it. His feet obeying the music is like when I have to ask those weird questions, which surprisingly, I haven't had an itch to do here yet. We machifs got to do what we gots to do. After serving myself a serious second helping of pancakes, I take some toast and bacon. I see some small blueberries and add a heaping pile to my plate. Can I just say yum? Who knew an elderly man in his 60s could cook like this? And these blueberries... They might possibly be the best I've ever tasted. Grandpa, where did you guys buy these blueberries? They're amazing. Would you mind if I run out and buy some more? I just ate the last of them. Oh, you like those berries, do you? Apple, those were your mama's favorites. They're June berries. When Grandma gets up, we'll head out to get some more. The mention of my mother makes my eyes descend to my plate. My whole life, it's been an unspoken rule that my mother is not talked about in casual conversation. But here, my mother is talked about like she's just left the room and will be back shortly, as if she's still part of the family. I'm beginning to like that. Grandpa, what was mom like when she was growing up? My eyes are cast down, not wanting to see any pain, but I'm hoping for a glimpse, a new chapter in my life. When I ask this, his entire face changes like a new bud opening on a flower. Your mama, well, she was a gift. She sure was. There was just so much love in her. He starts to get a faraway look. But boy, was she a handful growing up. Ha! We lived out in Flanders, South Dakota when she was little. It was, I was finishing my schooling, college, and your grandma worked in a laundromat. Since we were both working so much, we had to hire a babysitter to watch her during the day. Shaking his head with a laugh. That starts in his chest, he adds, Ha! If only we could keep a sitter. We must have gone through six or seven women in just two months' time. Okay, so why did they keep leaving? Grandpa puts down the dishes he was drying, untucks the towel from his belt, and sits next to me at the table. 
With his fingers, he starts counting. Babysitter number one left after she found your mother trying to clean the kitchen floor. She poured vegetable oil all over, invited our little neighbor girl over, and they had what looked like a skating party. Feet gliding all over the floor. Babysitter number two quit after realizing there was a sticky mess by her car gas cap on her car. Apparently, you know who, thought the car looked hungry, so she poured grape jelly in the gas compartment. I haven't thought about this in a long time. Do you want to hear more? Please. I don't know much of anything about her, and when I hear everyone talk about her here, I start to feel, I don't know, lighter. I know just what you mean, Apple. Just what you mean. Okay, let's see now. Where was I? Number three babysitter quit after she came down with the worst case of poison ivy I've ever seen. But how was that mom's fault? I ask. It seems that your mom gave the sitter some flowers she picked, and they just happened to be poison ivy and itching clover. The rest of the ladies all left for similar reasons, he says, shaking his head with a trace of a smile dancing on his lips. Which is why your mama's grandma, Elizabeth, started babysitting her. No one else could handle her. After thinking for a few minutes, and polishing off the last of the bacon, I have a thought. But it seems to me that Mom wasn't naughty or bad. She was trying to be helpful. She tried to help clean the floors, make the car feel better, and gave someone flowers. For a young girl, she tried to be helpful in her own way. How's that bad? Grandpa smiles a great grin, pats me on the top of the head, and says, You know, I think you just might be right. Ah, I can hear Grandma getting up. We'll go get you some of those berries you like so much. Because, my girl, you gotta eat. He's always saying, we gotta eat. But what do I eat to feed my starving soul? Grandma gets up and chides Grandpa for making a mess in her kitchen. But then hears that I'd like some more June berries and relents. I'm wondering what I should wear. I mean, I don't want to stand out and make everyone realize I don't fit in. Yet I also want to make an impression. What would it feel like to be the same as them? After all, no one around here knows me, and therefore, there's a possibility that I could belong. It's really all I want for Christmas.